Hello and welcome back to a new video. So here we will talk about the meconium aspiration syndrome. So meconium aspiration occurs when the baby pass meconium when they are inside the uterus and then during labor the baby would aspirate this meconium leading to respiratory distress that we call the meconium aspiration syndrome. And here we will talk about a definition, pathophysiology, clinical features, and we also are going to talk about the x-ray interpretation and the diagnosis and treatment of this condition. You can skip to other parts of this video using the video chapters available in the video description. So first, let's start with the definition. So meconium aspiration syndrome which is abbreviated as MAS, is a neonatal respiratory distress that occurs when the neonate pass meconium in utero, leading to meconium-stained amniotic fluid and aspirated during labor. So when the fetus aspirate the meconium, it would block the airways of the fetus and lead to respiratory distress in form of tachypnea. Uh, tachypnea means increase the respiratory rate into more than 60 per minute and also nasal flaring and intercostal and subcostal recessions and so on. And the mass is diagnosed only if the respiratory distress cannot be attributed to another cause like pneumonia, sepsis, transient tachypnea of the neonate, respiratory distress syndrome and congenital heart diseases. So we have to exclude those differentials before we diagnose the meconium aspiration syndrome. And the meconium aspiration syndrome symptoms can range from mild respiratory system distress to severe distress with respiratory failure. Now let's mention the important points in epidemiology. So meconium stained amniotic fluid is seen in 10 to 20% of all deliveries. So 10 to 20% of all the deliveries the baby would pass meconium in uterus, leading to meconium stained amniotic fluid. And 5% of those infants which have meconium stained amniotic fluid would develop the meconium aspiration syndrome. So only 5% of those infants would develop the meconium aspiration syndrome. And the mortality rate is about 2%. So out of the 5%, 2% would die due to this condition and the meconium aspiration syndrome is common in infants with breech presentation now let's talk about the causes of the meconium aspiration syndrome so the first cause is fetal distress and hypoxia so hypoxic stress on the fetus due to many causes including placental causes and mother related causes and fetus related causes the hypoxic stress would enhance the intestinal peristalsis and relax the anal sphincter and this would lead to passage of meconium into the amniotic fluid which would lead to meconium stained amniotic fluid and subsequent meconium aspiration syndrome the other cause is related to the fetal maturity so the intestinal parasympathetic innervation and myelination increases in later pregnancy and we know that the parasympathetic stimulation related to increasing the peristalsis movements. So when the parasympathetic innervation increases, this would lead to parasympathetic increasing the intestinal peristalsis and subsequent passing of the meconium into the amniotic fluid and subsequent aspiration and meconium aspiration syndrome. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of the meconium aspiration syndrome. So the baby passes meconium in utero due to the causes we mentioned before. And during the delivery process, when the fetus become hypoxic, the hypoxia causes the fetus to start breathing and gasping, which lead to aspiration of the meconium stained amniotic fluid into the lungs. So now the meconium is in the lungs of the baby and the meconium is a thick material it contains cellular debris of the skin, the gastrointestinal tract, 
and hair, and it also contains the gastrointestinal secretions, blood, and mucus, and when aspirated by the baby, it blocks the respiratory airways, same with the foreign bodies, so meconium can cause lung atelectasis when it completely obstructs the right or left bronchi. So meconium can cause atelectasis when it blocks on one of the main bronchi, or it can cause partial obstruction. And not only that, it also blocks the small airways. So now the meconium blocks the main airways and the small airways. And not just that, the meconium also triggers inflammation. So in 24 to 48 hours after birth, the airways get inflamed by the meconium because it has many materials that cause uh, inflammation in form of chemical pneumonitis and respiratory distress occurs. So the inflammation caused by the meconium lead to inactivation of the surfactant. Surfactant is very important for the alveoli to function well because if there is deficiency of the surfactant, this would lead to increase the surface tension of the alveoli and the alveoli would collapse. So when the meconium spread in the lungs, this would lead to a surfactant deficiency and alveoli collapsing which furtherly aggravate the respiratory distress. And the blood supply to the obstructed airways and collapsed alveoli would be decreased due to vasoconstriction. So as an attempt from the lungs to shunt more blood towards the open airways to maintain oxygenation. So when there is an area in the lung that has no air in it, no air reaching it, the vessels there would constrict trying to bump the blood into the other areas with air. And this would lead to a shunting. So there is shunting of the blood to maintain oxygenation. And if the previous process, which is the vasoconstriction, occurs extensively in the lungs, this will lead to substantial increase in the vascular resistance because the vasoconstriction lead to increase the vascular resistance in the lungs, which lead to a condition called persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, which is abbreviated as PPHN. And the persistent pulmonary hypertension may cause right side heart failure because there is a lot of stress on the heart. So all of these factors mentioned, obstruction of the airways, inflammation, shunting, and increase in the uh, vascular resistance in the lungs, all of those lead to ventilation perfusion mismatch this means that there is a lot of areas in the lungs that would have decreased ventilation because of the obstructed airways and there is a lot of areas in the lungs that would have decreased perfusion because of the vasoconstriction and this would lead to hypoxemia which is decrease the oxygen concentration in the blood. And also the meconium obstruct the airways as we mentioned but also lead to air trapping over distension of the lungs and extra alveolar air leaks and subsequently pneumothorax. So now the meconium lead to obstruction of the airways, inflammation, it lead to vasoconstriction, and it lead to air trapping and pneumothorax. Now let's talk about the risk factors of meconium aspiration syndrome. So the first one being the fetal distress during labor and the post-term pregnancy the greater infant's gestational age, the greater the risk of passing meconium in utero. And also prolonged labor because it increased the chance of fetal hypoxia and maternal related risk factors which include diabetes and hypertension because those two risk factors lead to placental problems and would lead to increase the resistance to blood flow through the placenta and subsequently fetal hypoxia. And intrauterine growth restriction of the fetus would also increase the risk for meconium aspiration syndrome and maternal substance abuse like tobacco, amphetamines, and cocaine. Now let's talk about the clinical features of the meconium aspiration syndrome. So it's a term or a post-term infant because remember, the higher the gestational age, the higher the risk for the meconium aspiration syndrome and this infant would be present with respiratory distress and meconium stained amniotic fluid. Respiratory distress present as tachypnea, which is more than 60 breaths 
per minute, intercostal and subcostal retraction, nasal flaring, and use of accessory muscles. And on physical examination, there might be signs of post-maturity like peeling skin, long fingernails, and vernix, which is a protective layer that covers the baby skin. Now let's talk about the diagnosis. So one of the important tests that you send the meconium aspiration syndrome infant for is the chest x-ray. And if the infant aspirated the meconium, then the x-ray would show multiple batchy densities bilaterally and hyperinflation of the lungs, flattening of the diaphragm, and may also show atlaxes or collapsed lung due to pneumothorax. So here we have a chest x-rays. On the left is a normal chest x-ray and on the right is meconium aspiration syndrome a chest x-ray. So on the no normal one, we can see that the lung fields are clear. If we compare it to the right, we can see that there is multiple uh, densities all over the lung. If we, uh, we can see multiple here and also here and here. There is also flattening of the diaphragms. So those are the diaphragms here. They are, they are pretty flat compared to those here, which look normal. And also there is hyperinflation of the lung. If you compare the lung size to the heart size on the right picture, to the lung size to the heart size on the left picture, you can see that the lung on the right picture is bigger than the lung on the left picture. With the flat diaphragm on the right picture, those all mean that the lung on the right picture is hyperinflated. So we also measure the oxygen saturation. If the oxygen saturation is less than 95%, we supply oxygen to the baby and we measure the arterial blood gas analysis to evaluate for respiratory failure and to assess the acid-base balance. And we also order an echocardiography to look for right ventricular dysfunction due to the persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. And we order blood cultures to look for sepsis uh, and empirical antibiotics should be considered uh, in case there is a suspicion of sepsis. Now let's talk about the treatment for the meconium aspiration syndrome. So the infant born to meconium stained amniotic fluid should have routine postnatal care with monitoring for signs of respiratory distress. Endotracheal suctioning is no longer recommended. Just an oral and nasal suctioning is enough. So previously the endotracheal suctioning was recommended for the uh, infants born to stained amniotic fluid, but nowadays it's no longer recommended, just the nasal and the oral are enough. And if the infant developed respiratory distress, then management is supportive. The oxygen supplementation is needed if the oxygen saturation drops below 95%. As I mentioned, assisted ventilation techniques are used if the hypoxemia is refractory to oxygen therapy. So if the oxygen didn't improve with oxygen supplementation, then assisted ventilation techniques are required. The blood glucose is monitored and supplied if needed, and the surfactant may be needed. And nitric oxide is pulmonary vasodilator that can be used in persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Glucocorticoids can be used to suppress inflammation and antibiotics are used if the cultures are, are positive. Now let's talk about the complications of the meconium aspiration syndrome. So persistent pulmonary hypertension is the first one. And also pneumothorax should be considered and neonatal hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, which may lead to cerebral palsy in the future of this infant. Finally, let's talk about the prevention so if the meconium stained amniotic fluid is seen by the obstetrician, then obstetrician should suction the infant oropharynx before delivering the, the rest of their body.
So when the meconium stage amniotic fluid is seen and the fetal head is delivered, then the oropharynx should be suctioned by the obstetrician, then the rest of the body is delivered. And with that, we reach the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you want to support more, you can by subscribing to the Patreon. Link provided in the description of this video. Thank you guys for watching and peace.